Brad, thank you so much for making the time to talk to me today. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Sure thing. Um, listen, welcome to the show. I'm excited to talk about careers and young talent. But before we get into that, give us a little bit of snapshot about your career story and kind of catch us up to speed to what you're doing today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think one of the things whenever you kind of take a look at my career history, it really kind of follows a uh, a very, very consistent theme throughout. And I'm kind of one of these people that always kind of started out with this central compass of wanting to uh, do good for others and wanting to help. Um, you know, and I think anybody who gets in the helping profession sort of knows that about themselves and um, and feels that uh, they want to do things that contribute to others. And so uh, from a very early age, I'd even say 14, 15, 16, I kind of knew I wanted to do something that, you know, uh, was going to be a service to other people. I just didn't quite know what. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was right around that time where, you know, I had some, some difficulties and challenges in my personal life and in my family life. And um, that exposed me to the world of mental health. Um, you know, I went through some counseling and uh, really benefited from it. And I, I looked at that as an opportunity to be able to kind of say, wow, you know, this, this obviously made a change for me. I wonder if this could be a vehicle to uh, help others. And so I started my uh, venture out into wanting to do something uh, in that, that counseling, um, marriage and family therapy space. And so uh, I got my degree in psychology and uh, ultimately decided to uh, pursue a master's degree in community counseling and then um, obviously got licensed after that and uh, started my career in Virginia where I was living um, and then uh, ultimately moved uh, to Michigan to be with my wife and her family and uh, continued on that path. And then over the years, um, you know, I just ventured into pursuing so many different areas within mental health that exposed me to so much more. And one of the one of the positions that I took very early on when I moved to Michigan was working in residential treatment. And one of the neat areas about residential treatment was um, the youth that we were working with uh, all needed to have a uh, education or career goal as part of their treatment plan. It was just uh, that's how um, the um, the uh, program was structured. And I thought that was great. And, but one of the things that I really, really noticed was that I would get super excited anytime that I had to talk about that with um, the, uh, the, the youth that I was working with. And it was kind of like, over time, I just kind of go, like, the other elements of this job are so draining. <laughs> you know, the planning, the paperwork, the, you know, all of the, the going to court, all of those other things. It was just so draining. But that one just energized me. And it kind of like led me to think, wow, you know, maybe I, I, I need to make a little bit of a detour here. And um, and so not to escape from mental health, but maybe think about a different avenue or a different way to, to venture in. So I thought about transitioning into uh, school counseling. And so I actually did a short program, um, got certified to actually work in schools. I had applied for a couple of positions, but then um, by random chance, I just happened to stumble into higher education. I met um, uh, the Dean of Arts and Sciences at a local community college, and she kind of said, hey, we have, we have a job opening. And um, and again, it was just like, again, one of those random chance encounters, got to love networking. <laughs> and I I just, uh, I started working at a, at a community college, working with um, uh, new freshmen prim primarily. And then I started teaching courses there. And one of the courses that I, I taught uh, that I volunteered for was um, uh, career decision making. And uh, from that moment on, I was absolutely hooked in career development. I, I loved working with those students. I love seeing the progression, seeing the growth, seeing those light bulbs go off and those aha moments. And for me, um, I didn't fall out of love with mental health. I fell more in love with, with career development. And then you know, from there, I just I, I took a few different other positions at educational institutions. And then ultimately um, found my way into, you know, what I do now is I work for educational regional services uh, agency um, that and I'm primarily working with recent high school graduates. So I freaking love that. And then I also started my own business two years ago where I work generally with people who are a little bit further along, maybe college grads or those just entering into their careers. That's awesome.
Hey you, thanks for watching. If you're enjoying this episode, make sure to share it with friends and family who might find it interesting. Make sure to hit the subscribe button as well to stay up to date on weekly new videos that are going to be coming out with some awesome guests that I bring on. And uh, if you have any questions, use the comment section to ask me questions, to interact. I look forward to talking to you. That's awesome. And I love the, the kind of connection you made between mental health and career development, because I think that we always try to separate. But in fact, a lot, a lot of our stressors and mental well-being challenges, a lot of them come from our work or the lack of purpose, the lack of we don't know what value we're adding. And all of that impacts mental health in, in, in many aspects, as well as other parts of our life and experiences and all of that. So I think it's and, and I love it that you kind of again, married the two, and then you said, I just love career development more, but I still enjoy mental health. And I think that you're still kind of doing um, th that, that service within that space, because again, helping people figure out what they want to do for their careers is such a big part of overall well-being, right? And uh, so it's, um, I mean, it's, you, you know, the statistics as well as I do in terms of how many people are disengaged in their work. So it's, and, and that adds a lot of uh, uh, pressure uh, across board, uh, mental health included. So, um, so I think it's 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 a nice it's a nice kind of marriage that you've created there. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, and I I think you know when when looking at you know what I do now and the work that I do, having the mental health background has done nothing but serve me well um, because I do have um, certain. Uh, skills in terms of communication, yes, and, and those things are very helpful, but just really understanding things like motivation and behavior mm -hmm. and what drives people to, uh, to do things the way that they do, fear and avoidance and mm -hmm. uh, these things that really kind of contribute to, you know, an individual maybe not progressing the way that they want to progress or, or self-sabotage or all of these different things. I mean, as you kind of pointed out, they're so intertwined with our careers, but, mm -hmm. but really kind of, you know, having that, that baseline understanding of why somebody is, is, is doing things a certain way, uh, even when it's to their own detriment, right. can help you reduce those barriers and can help you work past them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, you're spot on with that. So it's, um, I, and, and now we have so much research coming out in terms of like, you know, neuroscience and how the brain operates and in terms of like how we process and reach where our behaviors come from and, and how do you make the change? So I think it's a very exciting space to be in in general. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people undermine um, the profession of that career development aspect and the, the, the power that it now has today, because especially after the pandemic and, you know, people have gone through so many changes. And I think it's, it's become more and more important to have professionals like yourself who can have that conversation who can who can create awareness and access to information that can help them essentially make very important life decisions which is around careers right so i think it's um it's super super important um so I, i'm curious um was there a specific reason you kind of um wanted to do to work with young people because sometimes you you see higher education professionals kind of start with the working with young people and then usually say oh, maybe i want to go into corporate learning or adult learning but you kind of you like this population of 18 to 30. Um, what's most exciting to you about working with them yeah that's a really good question and i think it's it's hard to put my finger on exactly what it is but i you know over the years, obviously, um, I have had uh, the tremendous honor and opportunity to be able to work with literally everyone. And, you know, uh, particularly through through the mental health settings that I've had, I mean, you name it, you know, <laughs> I've probably worked with, with uh, a certain type of individual over the last, you know, 15 years or so. And, uh, you know, that part has been really exciting because it's, it's given me an opportunity to really see and, and uh, absorb what I do like and, and really where I feel like um, is my zone and my sweet spot. And, um, you know, I, I think two things really come to mind in, in terms of what, what fires me up about this particular group. I think number one is I still see so much myself um, in them. Um, I still see this, um, this mentality of, oh my God, it's such a big world. And that's really scary and really daunting. And, you know, I don't know who to turn to. I don't know where to get information. And particularly now, I mean, when I was growing up, the internet was not what it is today. And, um, and now it is, you know, I, I think that the best quote that I've ever heard is that we are, 
we're drowning in information, but starving for wisdom. And oh, I think, yeah, and we're so, and it's so prevalent today where we have an abundance of content, abundance of, of opinion, uh, but it's hard to really extrapolate what are the, the real nuggets that are going to lead to uh, really great things for us and, and provide what we need. And so, um, so I, I look at that as, as being, um, you know, an opportunity to really, you know, give back because I've certainly been in that, that situation myself. Um, but also I, I, what I really enjoy about this particular generation and why I like working with them so much is the fact that um, uh, the open-mindedness um, mm -hmm. and the willingness to explore, to experiment, um, you know, even to take chances, even when they're afraid. Um, I see a lot more, and again, this is just my, in my experience, I don't mean to overgeneralize, but I see that, that willingness to take certain leaps of faith and really know that at 16, 17, 18, um, your, uh, the, the luxury that you have is you can do more of that mm -hmm. <laughs> without it being catastrophic. And, um, and that's pretty exciting. Obviously, we don't get those, those luxuries in our 30s and 40s um, that we do early on uh, to, to really dive in and, and say, you know what, if I want to take a class in this or, you know, I want to try out for a new sports team or I want to join a club or whatever. We, you know, a lot of times, you know, just because of our own experiences and where we're at in our life and our conditions, we might be a little more set you know, in our mm -hmm. ways. And, um, and that's been my experience. So I just love that uh, ability to kind of work and mold and, and, yeah. and take those chances. That's also, you got me reminiscing. And I was like, oh, yes, I remember that freedom of like, particular to like, you know, take any class and continue to learn and sport and like try so many different things. And, and everybody's so willing to help you, <laughs> right? Like Everybody's like, yes, come, we will train you, we'll invest in you, just come on board, you know? And like, when you get into your 30s and 40s, it's like, no, the world is not as kind in many cases and not as forgiving about jumping careers. So yeah, you, you got me to think about that. No, it, it, is, it is a beautiful, place to be in and again i think at that age as well uh, this is when young people really need that support and that you know because um you know statistically and just in schools and universities the the per student career advisor ratio i mean it, 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 it's yeah. it's you know there's hundreds of students sometimes in the large universities that are per one career advisor so i mean and we all know these are challenges in universities and and etc. Yeah. So it's very difficult to have that. So I think just having somebody like stuff, even even your podcast and kind of the knowledge that you share is so beneficial because it just goes back to awareness and access. And this is what I feel a lot of young people are, um, you know, depending on, on the uh, background and environment, a lot of people just don't have uh, access to inf certain information, um, not necessarily awareness of possibilities that are out there, right? And on top of that, the, the generations, we're always judging the previous generations before us, right? So talk yeah. to me a little bit about like, what are the misconceptions that you know, the, the, you know, what are the misconceptions that we have of generations that are coming behind us, right? Like, why are we so hard on them? Like, what, the, what, what should, what should we know about that generation that maybe we're not, we're wrong about? Yeah. I mean, you, <laughs> you just like nailed it. You absolutely nailed it. Because I mean, if you really look throughout history, uh, every, generation thinks they're the best and <laughs> will will kind of put down others i'm a millennial i would be considered more of a an older millennial um i hate the term <laughs> geriatric millennial but that's <laughs> that's technically what i am the elderly um, millennial yeah I'm an elderly <laughs> millennial but i remember i remember millennial used to be like this ugh, this <laughs> like really stigmatized word like we were we were terrible we were self-entitled and um you know just uh very arrogant we didn't want to listen you know we just kind of did our own thing but it's interesting a lot of the same sentiments are now being said about gen z but i think um you know i think a lot of the things that that we kind of see with um you know how how Gen Z is being perceived um, could be, as you kind of pointed out, there there are misconceptions, but I think a lot of it just has to do with um, the angle in which that we're utilizing to view it. So one of which that that really sticks out is that um, that Gen Z 
you know, is completely dependent on technology. We don't know how to function without it. Um, you know, they are, um, they're, they lack uh, the ability to communicate with others. And, you know, it's really more of like, if you're looking at it from the eye of, you know, millennial or Gen X or, or, or baby boomer or any other, um, of course, it's going to appear that way. Um, but you have to also think and consider uh, this is the world that they grew up in. They didn't have a choice in the matter. Um, technology was integrated in their existence. And so um, that is their uh, one of their main modalities of communication. And if you do take that away, you do take away part of who they are um, by consequence. Um, and so I think it's it's just an important distinction to be able to kind of make um, that that doesn't necessarily have to equate to a negative. Uh, that can be an opportunity to be able to learn and be able to kind of say, well, how do we how do we use that for good? And how do we work to, um, you know, create some understanding around that and really be able to uh, find, you know, points of commonality. And um, and so interestingly, I think a lot of companies are, are really uh, working to do that because we're saying, well, maybe, you know, we have labor shortages in certain areas and we want to be able to appeal to a younger demographic. We want to attract, um, you know, that kind of a clientele. So, you know, let's allow them to submit a, a TikTok video resume uh, as an example. That's, you know, right up their alley. It's the medium in which they utilize to communicate with their peers and their friends. Um, and now you're, you're allowing them to twist it in a professional sense. And so, I think there's there's a lot of like really really great opportunities like that that um, that could be taken advantage of, but um, but again, mm -hmm. I think it really just kind of relates back to what are um, you know what are those things that um, you know really are you know just kind of uh, elements of how they work and how they operate. Uh, you know, being entrepreneurial is another one. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think you know this generation heavily wants to be able to find opportunities for independents to do their own thing, not necessarily to start their own business, but to feel like they are in control and they take ownership of their career. And they've really, really rejected the idea and the notion that I have to just kind of follow the path because it's the path. Um, and that part, again, I mean, is that a bad thing? Uh, I think it's I think it's an amazing opportunity because now think about the innovation that's going to come from that. So. You know, these are these are again, you know, <laughs> you know, the boxes that we can kind of open up. <laughs> yeah, no, I think you're spot on with that because I think that in the world where good talent is hard to find, a big part of the reason why it's hard to find good talent because a lot of people are just not sure what they like to do. They don't know what they're good at. So if we're able to kind of, you know, help them, groom them in a way that makes sense to them, they will be more entrepreneurial, right? They will be more creative, more innovative and all those things. And that benefits everybody around that individual, right? So I think, and, and I think that this generation is coming in. I mean, the millennials, like we kind of like, I'm also an elder millennial. And like, we kind of like started, like some of us started to push for that, but the Gen Z and then Gen Alphas are definitely are the ones that are like really pushing for that. And companies have no, no, um, uh, no, like what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, they have to uh, they have to oblige essentially right so they have to oblige they don't have a choice that's what i was looking for they don't have a choice because otherwise they're just not going to have talent coming into their doors if they keep operating at an old school way an old school approach because the talent that's coming into our doors today is looking for something different from even you and i and, and generations yeah. before us so the boomers that are still kind of leading on the leadership side of many companies are starting to see it more and more because I'm, I'm in talent development and I can tell you big, big challenges for companies today. Um, so it's, um, it's a big issue. So I think they, they just don't have a choice anymore. So on, on that point, I'm also curious, there's, you know, com companies or even universities, you know, it's like the, the, to be able to get into a good university, you have to have X, Y, and Z. To be able to get a job, you need to have two years of experience. But from where, like, where, where do, what do you recommend for young people or, you know, I guess for both sides, on one side, the young people, like, what do you do when you don't have that experience? Like, where do you find that experience? And then for companies and universities, like, 
what do they need to change to adjust to the fact that not everybody is going to go to a four-year university, right? How do you expect people to have a two years of experience with, when they just graduated, for example, right? That's that's the, the like, you know, young people have hard time sometimes finding jobs right now uh, for, for various reasons, but any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. You know, I think from uh, just from the, the student, young person, uh, Gen Z side of things, you know, I, I think it's, uh, absolutely imperative to be able to utilize that that entrepreneurial spirit that so many of them carry uh, to be able to think about and create opportunities. And there's absolutely an abundance of them uh, if they're willing to look and they're willing to maybe step out of their comfort zones a, a little bit. You know, one of the, um, you know, things that I, uh, practice, preach, and, and also teach uh, in terms of, of those types of things is really being able to, to say, if you have a goal down the road, uh, one of the best things that you can do is look at the breadcrumbs that, that lead to that goal. You know, So finding opportunities to be able to interview, um, informational interview with individuals who are currently doing the work that you would love to be doing in a few years, uh, I think is amazing. And then really kind of digging into what skills did they have to develop to make them successful in that role? And then really backtracking it to where are the pockets of opportunity to get those skills? So, you know, one of which is free. It's the easiest thing to do is just volunteer. Uh, there's so many opportunities in volunteering, no matter where you live, they probably have a volunteer hub. Um, you know, you can go to a website like Volunteer Match, for example, and get tons and tons of listings of really, really great volunteer opportunities in your area doing any number of different things. So that's that's a really, really great opportunity that so many people don't take advantage of, but it's still skill building. Uh, it's still applicable in terms of being able to put it on your resume and it, there's still really really great tools to be able to communicate when you're when you are meeting with employers you know another really uh you know great one is um um i lost my train of thought sorry about that <laughs> edit that part out uh, <laughs> you're good <laughs> we keep it authentic um, around here yeah <laughs> oh no you're good um uh is uh, freelance. Um, mm -hmm. There are so many neat opportunities to be able to uh, do freelance and gig work, um, you know, through websites like Fiverr, um, where uh, honestly, it's an opportunity to, to build up a portfolio uh, for yourself and, and really uh, dig into something that, that you want to do. I mean, th there's so many needs, and particularly for creative types, I think it's an, uh, it's a really fantastic opportunity to um, utilize, um, you know, Fiverr and Upwork and all of these real, real great hubs to be able to kind of, you know, dig in and, and, uh, and develop those. Then you have this, this abundance of, of outlets in terms of skill building, you know, you've got LinkedIn Learning, you've got Coursera, you've got Udemy, you've got Khan Academy, all of these offering like free and reduced skill building courses, that can be done in very sizable chunks, asynchronous, so you can pace it out. Um, and these are opportunities to demonstrate growth, to also showcase, you know, what you have been working on in terms of your goals in the future. So these are so many, there, there are just so many opportunities to get out there and get exposed. But I really, really do believe that it starts with that end goal, that end destination, and really kind of finding if I want to be at this place in three years, if I want to be at this place in five years, what would I need to know now in order to get there? And then mm. really work on that reverse goal setting. Mm. Yeah, I like that. I think a lot of um, students kind of focus on just focus on their studies. And they think that once they graduate, right, they're just going to land that job. And you're right, it's a lot of it's, there's so much that needs to be done, you have to be super proactive around it. And yeah, I agree on the volunteer aspect. And um, I'll, I'll throw another suggestion in there in terms of websites. So catch a fire, uh, catch a fire is a really good one. Um, I don't know, I'm sure you've heard of it. So that, yeah, that's a good, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a good one as well to kind of build up with that portfolio, right? Um, and, um, and again, at the end of the day, like once you have that career portfolio, essentially, you know, I always tell people like, they don't care if you were getting paid for it. They just want to see if you can do the job. 
right? So in any case, that experience matters. Like that's like, and, and, and if it's between not doing anything versus doing something pro bono or just taking any action, I would always go this way. I would never just not do nothing. I would not recommend doing nothing because <laughs> action creates action, right? And so yeah. it's, um, yeah. Yeah, you're dropping the mic right there on that one because I've, I've literally said the same thing. And I, I have a, a former client of mine who is a, a shining example of that. And, uh, you know, she's uh, getting started in a career in, um, in uh, graphic design and copywriting. She's a creative mind, creative type. And, and so luckily, I, I've been able to, to um, you know, get her connected with some opportunities. But she did. She had to, to kind of do some experimentation and be able to kind of say, it doesn't have to be paid. I still need to develop my skills. I need to hone my craft. I need to show an employer what I can do so that when the opportunity does come around to get paid, I'm going to have something to show them. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and she's doing that, she's rocking it. And mm -hmm. so, but it's taken a while to get there, but, um, but there are opportunities for sure. Yeah. Um, so I think like also in reports showed like the last couple of years, the still the most popular major in many undergraduate universities uh, around the world is business administration. But we know that tech is one of the most, uh, you know, understaffed uh, uh, industries right now, particularly like cybersecurity in these places, right? I mean, there's like, I, I don't know, I, I don't quote me on this, but things like today, there's like 700,000 cybersecurity jobs open and, there, and we're going to need 2 million more in the next three years or so, something along the like ridiculous amount of numbers, that right? Me. Yeah. And so, yet not many students are kind of pursuing that, or at least that's that's my assumption, right? So do you see students and young talent going more into tech? Are they like, do you see a trend? Like, are they following the trend of what's needed in the job market? Or do you, is it all over the place? Do, is there a trend? Is there any themes? Yeah, man, you know, that's a really, really good question. And um, I would want to, to say that it's kind of a hodgepodge and it, just in my experience and i can mm -hmm. only speak from my experience but sure. um but i would say right now just in terms of what i have seen more of the students uh recent graduates that i've been working with kind of veering into is a little bit more healthcare than anything else mm -hmm. um again um that could just be the area that i'm living in it could just be <laughs> just the, the yeah. caseload of of uh of students and clients that i've been working with but i've been seeing a little bit more into that area um than anything else however um there are uh you know, I, I would say a sizable amount of attraction into uh, tech, uh, particularly, you know, software, um, mm -hmm. programming. Um, I do have in individuals who are interested in, in cybersecurity, uh, just different, um, different functions of IT and coding. And, and um, so I would certainly say that the attraction is there and there's certainly enough, uh, as you pointed out, there's enough statistics to really point the need and the mm -hmm. demand the income potential, mm -hmm. <laughs> all of the, all of the above um, for that area. But um, in my particular work, one of the things that, um, that, you know, we really, really uh, try to do and, and work heavily into is providing exposure um, and, and really maintaining a diversity in, in terms of what we're exposing um, our kids to and, and letting them know that there are really, really amazing opportunities that are completely out of your awareness. And so let me kind of break those down for you, what they could be. Um, so in, within the Metro Detroit region, um, you know, because we are surrounded by the automotive um, companies, the big three, Ford, GM, and Chrysler, manufacturing is huge here. So because of where we're at, you know, uh, geographically, there are so many opportunities in advanced manufacturing machining, CNC, numerical mm -hmm. control, mechatronics, robotics, uh, welding. There's so many opportunities in that area here. Um, and we want to make sure that, that our kids really know about those and are, are bringing those opportunities to them in the classroom and through site visits and so forth. So that's a lot of the work that I do with Wayne Risa, but also mm -hmm. um, 
in other areas of, of skilled trades and construction. You know, those opportunities are never going away. The skills are going to change and they're going to differ a little bit with technology, but uh, but there's a huge demand in, in uh, construction and, and skilled trades in that area too. So we really just want to try to, um, you know, from the standpoint of, of our work and, and what I try to do is um, really try to meet them where they're at and kind of say, you know, you might um, find some really, really great opportunities for your unique personality, your unique mm -hmm. skill set, and your potential in this area um, that, uh, that may or may not involve community college or university. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, again, super important. Not everybody's meant for a four-year degree and not everybody needs it. Not everybody wants it. Like there's just, and, and trade schools, I feel, are, are coming back a little bit more. Apprenticeships, like those traditional apprenticeships, I feel like that's on the rise, which is really exciting to me because I'm a, uh, listen, I'm completely biased. I'm like, you should try, you should, you should experiment, you should volunteer, you should do apprenticeships, all of those things. So I'm so glad that it's coming back more and more because that was, I think that was how life was in the 60s and 70s where people like before you even got a job, like you went through that apprenticeship it was like a must do thing, right? Yeah. And then it just kind of like, you know, kind of uh, went away. But now I see a lot more of that coming back, um, yeah. which is really exciting. A funny story about that. I mm -hmm. think, uh, you know, we have an opportunity in our work to uh, get to meet with, collaborate, and network with uh, a lot of the local labor unions. And it's really, really interesting to hear them talk about that concept. And, and one of them like hit it really, really well. I think he was uh, a plumber. And uh, he really said, you know, like, you know, for a long time, that was the message. That was kind of what you did. You know, you 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 find a job, right? It's in demand where you can, mm -hmm. you know, work and, you know, support your family and, um, and, uh, and, and, you know, and do kind of follow that sort of mode or, or method because that's kind of the way that it was always done. Mm -hmm. And then over the course of like the 70s and 80s, a, a little bit of a, a transition happened and higher education and college became incredibly popular because those individuals who went through that path said, this is hard work. <laughs> <laughs> this is not exactly easy. Yeah. I want you to have more opportunities available to you and not just mm -hmm. do the thing because it was what you should do. Yeah. Um, but I want to expose you to more opportunities. And so that whole generation said, all right, let's jump on the college bandwagon. Let's go. And, and then you know, now we're kind of like shifting back because we're realizing, hey, we've got deficits in this area. Yeah. Not everybody's cut out for four years. You know, we really need to like meet people where they're at because everybody's going to do better as a result. You know. Mm -hmm. Now, listen, one more question for you. What do you feel is the biggest challenge for university graduates today or community college graduates or people entering the job market? What do you see is the biggest challenge and, and what is the solution in your opinion, if you had one? Oh, that's deep. Uh, that's a really, really good question. Um, choose one. There's many challenges. Just choose oh, yeah. the, the top one. Goodness, I just don't know where to start. <laughs> you know, I, I think I think as it pertains to um, as it pertains to individuals uh, that are, you know, really, you know, coming into um, a, a really kind of chaotic time and a, a really chaotic job market today, where you know, there's like high demand in some areas, low supply, high supply and low demand. And it's just, it's really mm -hmm. wonky. And, um, you know, with all of that being said, I, I think one of the, the things that I impress upon the students and the clients that I work with is that the credential alone will not be enough. The mm -hmm. resume alone will not be enough. You know, you know it, it, it's really about the story that you tell about what you can do, about your contributions and about why it matters. And I think probably one of the biggest challenges is related to doing the self-reflection necessary to communicate that. Because if you half-heart a job search, it's probably not gonna go very well. If you're kind of just kind of, you know, doing it to just get a job, um, you're not gonna approach it the same way as, as opposed to, I have a personal mission that I wanna fulfill. Mm -hmm. I have contributions that I want to make. I have a unique value that I can come in and immediately deliver for somebody. That's going to feel different. It's going to look different. It's going to be communicated significantly different than the person who just needs a job to mm -hmm. pay them the bills or, you know, to pay the bills. So I think the biggest thing is <clears throat> really, really um, 
as cliche as it sounds, really anchoring into your why, you know, mm -hmm. before you before you get out into the job market, really thinking about, you know, why do you want to do what you want to do? And then finding the people who share that same why, um, because then you're going to be in the best company. Opportunities are going to come to you. You're going to be exposed to more things that are going to allow you to grow and learn and develop within that. Um, and your advancement and success are ultimately going to be better in return. Um, but I think that's one of the biggest um, issues that, that so many have is they go through the two-year degree or the four-year degree or six years or however mm -hmm. long, and then they just get on autopilot and they think that's going to be enough. It's not. Yeah. It's, you know, you know, you've got to, you got to make a compelling story about why you're the best candidate. And so I, I think really digging into that why is necessary. Yeah. And I think that's also helpful when you're just even when you're transitioning careers later on, because, you know, your why might change and that's OK, but it's just at least you're continuing to kind of evolve and and keep that in mind continuously versus ending in, you know, mid level or senior level in your career and then realizing you don't mean like what you do anymore. And it sucked the soul out of you for the last 10, 15 years. <laughs> so yeah. I think just that's I, I think you're spot on. And that. I think it's important to, to understand why you're getting into something. Uh, even if it might change, but like, what does it look like in the near future? At least like, you know, nobody has to predict five year plans anymore. <laughs> Things change too fast, but yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, where can people find you? Where do you hang out on social media? Where do you post stuff? Um, where can people get in touch with you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, probably in terms of most activity, I tend to be most active on LinkedIn. Um, you can find me there under Brad W. Minton. Uh, probably should be fairly easy to find. Um, I'm also on Instagram at meant to be career. Uh, my website's meant to be career uh, The mint is spelled M-I-N-T. It's a playoff my last name. Um, trying to be. Oh, I didn't even catch that. That is cool. Yeah, like that. yeah. There's a story behind that, so I'm, I'll save that for another time. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Um. So, uh, and then obviously, you know, feel free. Uh, you know, you can reach out to me uh, through my contact information on my website. Um, meant to be career at gmail dot com is my uh, my email. So yeah, uh, would love to hear from anybody that uh, gained some value. Absolutely, but now I want to hear the story. Oh, okay. <laughs> Give so, me a snapshot of that story. <laughs> all right, I'll make it quick. All right. Um, so, um, 2007, I got married. My um, my wife and I were at the time kind of thinking about, you know, different things as far as the wedding and the reception and so forth. And um, I don't remember exactly how this happened or how this transpired, but um, but one of the things that we were doing was kind of looking at uh, different setups for the tables and so forth and different sort of, uh, you know, wedding favors and, and, and whatnot. And uh, one of the, the places that we um, kind of uh, scouted or, or looked into um, had these mint tins oh, right, yeah. that said meant to be. Oh, and, I love it. And, uh, but it was M-I-N-T. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, with my last name being Minton, it was like, hey, that's pretty cool. That's pretty clever. And, you know, um, so that's uh, and I always bank that in the back of my, my mind is kind of like that would be like a really, really neat, um, you know, uh, a neat play on mm -hmm. uh, my last name. Should I ever start a business? And so it was like it was only fitting that I, I chose that ultimately. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's really cool. Yeah, I like it. I like it. I like it. It's, it's unique. It's different. So yeah. it's very cool. Nice. Thank you for sharing that. Listen, Brad, thank you so much for taking the time. It's a pleasure to talk to you. And uh, hopefully we'll have another chat sometime soon. Absolutely. Thank you.